you. Cool. All right. So, like Cecilia said, we're going to be talking about uh, using WordPress tags and categories effectively. Uh, first off, just thanks everybody for being here because I do this a few times a year, and no matter how many times I do it, I'm still like grateful and just amazed that people want to listen to me talk. Like, I'm my own biggest fan. I love the sound of my own voice, and even I'm like, it's 3:45 on a Saturday. It's pretty nice out. Like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we're going to talk about uh, WordPress tags and categories, how to use them effectively, and a little bit about me to start. So uh, I've been uh, in SEO and WordPress for about five years. Uh, I've spent four of them at marketing agencies. Uh, and then about 18 months ago, I started my own company uh, in Philadelphia called Chris Berkeley Digital Marketing. Uh, in case it's unclear, I'm Chris Berkeley. Digital marketing is what I do. I had to pick the business name in like a week. There wasn't time for creative creativity. Uh, mission statement, uh, like Cecilia mentioned, again, bring enterprise level SEO to small and medium businesses through smart and efficient strategies that drive uh, meaningful, uh, measurable results and meaningful return on revenue. Um, previously, I worked with some pretty large companies um, with pretty heavy budgets at times, so that gave me the ability to test a lot of stuff and try things at scale and see what works when you, know, you have a lot of effort behind it and a, a marketing team to help you. Uh, and now I take that big agency experience and I bring it to smaller entities who maybe normally wouldn't be able to afford that, uh, but because I'm on my own, I operate a little bit more efficiently. Uh, personally, so uh, what I'm about, I like the Sixers. I'm a, a truster of the process. I think we're going all the way this year. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm into cycling, mountain biking, road biking. There's some great stuff in Bethlehem that I've actually ridden previously and, and some trips here. Uh, I'm a runner. I'm actually trying to run every street in Philadelphia right now. It's a little side project, and I'm making pretty good progress. Uh, and I like craft beer. So uh, you know, we had, we had a couple of those last night at dinner, and uh, Bethlehem does all right. So uh, yeah, let's jump in. Um, we'll talk about uh, categories and tags. Um, but before we do that, uh, I, I'm going to try to get the energy up here a little bit. Uh, I am a millennial is a term that's been used to describe me, which I don't love. Um, but we're kind of known for being a little uh, you know, self-obsessed. And we take a lot of selfies, apparently. So smile. <laughs> All right, and tweet that out later. So cool. Uh, what are categories and tags? Uh, well, if you're not familiar, uh, they're a method for organizing blog posts. They apply to WordPress posts, and they don't apply to WordPress pages. And to clarify uh, some terminology, uh, there is a, you know, it's a web page. It would basically be any page on a website. A WordPress post is going to be a blog post on a WordPress site. And then a WordPress page is going to be a page on a WordPress site. Um, so basically, you know, when we talk about posts versus pages, when you're in the back end and you're publishing, there's a functional difference between a WordPress post and a WordPress page. But they both fall under that overall umbrella of web pages when you're looking at them in a web browser. So that's an important distinguish, uh, distinguishment that we'll talk about today. Um, so categories versus tags, what's the difference? Well, categories are going to be more general, whereas tags are going to be more specific, and you should use them accordingly. So if you've never used them before, um, you can see this is in the post editor. They will be in the right-hand sidebar, usually under the publish date box and just above the featured image. And then you'll have the option to uh, you know, add your categories and tags there. So let's talk a little bit about building a category and tag structure, because that's really important to make sure that you're being strategic um, and maximizing um, you know, these to the best of your ability. So you're going to want to do this in advance. I don't advocate for making up categories or tags uh, willy-nilly. And when, what I mean by that is when you're actually publishing a post and you're sitting there brainstorming, oh, what tags and categories I'm, am I going to use, I think it's better to kind of make that up in advance and have a list or a, a spreadsheet that you refer to and say, these are the ones that I'm going to use based on what I write about. And that can kind of help you build your content strategy, too, because then you can say, all right, well, I'm going to talk about these specific things um, so that I'm continually writing about topics that are relevant to my site or my business. Um, that doesn't mean that the structure that you put in place has to be rigid forever. You know, it should be kind of fluid, and you should keep adding to it as needed. If there's new topics that you're writing about you know, in a few months, you can add categories and tags as needed to that list. And my recommendation is to try to use one to two categories and one to five tags per post. And we'll talk about uh, you know, some of the pitfalls of using too many uh, a little bit later on. 
So here's kind of an example of a category and tag structure. Um, this one is relevant to me um, because I'm in SEO and analytics. So my category would be SEO, and then under that some of my tags would be technical SEO or video SEO or local SEO. And then in the analytics section, you know, things that I blog about are Google Analytics and Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools. So that's kind of an example of how you could start to build out that structure so that your tags are kind of aligned with your categories and they're, um, you know, purposeful and to the point with what you're talking about. I don't recommend, oh sorry, I don't recommend duplicating uh, the same category or tag. I recommend kind of keeping them separate. Um, I do recommend building as many as you logically need to, no more, no less. And you can use subcategories if you want, um, which is where you can kind of add a category under another category, um, but you don't have to, and that would essentially add like a third tier if that makes sense. So here are some other examples outside of SEO and analytics to kind of help you, um, you know, grasp what I'm talking about a little bit better. If you had a site that talked about baking, um, you, for example, might use the category cakes. And if you had uh, different types of cakes, you could tag them as red velvet cake, vanilla cake, chocolate cake, so on and so forth. Um, if you had a website that was about construction or construction business, then you could, of course, tag things as either modular or residential or commercial, and that would be a way to start to categorize and, and segment your blog content. Um, that last one I left blank because I thought maybe we could do a little audience participation, get the blood flowing. Uh, does anybody want to tell me what their site or business is, and maybe we could brainstorm a, a structure briefly? Go ahead. Um, actually, it's not mine anymore, but it was uh, months ago. I worked at an arts council, and uh, we used our categories to distinguish between an arts events uh, announcements and a block of reviews and other uh, arts uh, commentary. Um, the blog being permanent posts, the announcements being stuff that's happening in the next few weeks, and when it's dead, it's going to be gone. And then we had subcategories under each of those, which were more of your tradition, you know, what you were saying as uh, you know, appropriate you know, categories, but we went kind of bonkers on tags. Yeah, so, so going bonkers is a bit of a problem. We'll talk about that. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of already, you've built something of a structure where, you know, you could do, you know, your category might be reviews, and then it might be, um, you know, theater, movies, um, yeah. other stuff like that. You could do another category that would maybe be events, and then that could be, you know, either tag it with different places that they're at. Um, tagging actual individual actors isn't a bad idea if you're going to see the same actor in multiple reviews, um, because otherwise you're creating tag pages with one post on them, and we'll talk about the, the downsides there. Yeah. Um, anybody else? All right, so my question is more, I, I have a website company, do yep. and stuff like that. I, I'm the guy who brings this play himself. Mm -hmm. And so I went bonkers back in 2009 with tons of categories. And someone told me that one category is main tags as you want. So I went back because supposedly back then categories meant more, more than one category meant people could content. And then it might have changed, whatever. But that tags don't create people with content. So then he said go haywire with tags. So I did my tag thing. It's crazy. So. Yeah, so that, and we can, we'll touch on that towards the end. I didn't talk a lot about that, but um, I, I definitely do with a lot of sites that do that. And cleanup is something that's kind of even harder to do. Um, if you're starting from scratch, it's a lot easier. But yeah, there's a point where you want to kind of go back and um, you know, start to clean it up and maybe eliminate some tags or find ones that only have one post associated. Um, and we'll talk about how many to use and why in a little bit. What website is a design? We have to redesign it anyway. Might as well give you one. It's, uh, it's a community theater that is looking to redesign their website. So if you want one that's uh, to give a design, it's, a, it's uh, a community theater that does uh, eight shows a year, four for adults, four for kids. They also have things like auditions that go on, um, a couple of one-off benefit events, and 
I don't know, wherever you want to go from there. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. So you could do events would be a great tag. Um, and then you could do, you know, like auditions. You could even maybe get into seasons like summer, winter, fall, that kind of thing. Um, you could do holidays maybe as a category and start to include individual tags for the different holiday events. Um, you know, you could definitely do, let's see, maybe a category for kids and then have, you know, tags for specific kids events, stuff like that. Um, lots of different ways you could go about it, but, you know, and, and there's flexibility here. You can kind of, it's up to you in choosing what's going to be a category and what kind of logically fits underneath it. Um, but yeah, that's generally the way I recommend doing it. And there's other ways you could do it, but I've found this strategy to work very well for my clients. So, cool. Okay, so let's talk about categories and tags for SEO because uh, I know we had an SEO talk today, but surprise, there's another. Um, and this is actually like one of the biggest issues with overusing or underusing categories and tags is that it has SEO implications more than anything else. So this might be the single most important slide of the entire talk today uh, is that stuffing keywords into categories and tags will not do anything for your SEO. So don't do it. So if we skip ahead, another slide. Um, here's an example of bad versus good. So on the left, I have seven tags, all of which are similar to each other. They're either plurals or they're spelling variations or they're um, acronyms instead of writing it out. Uh, and then on the right would be a good one where I'm tagging it as you know, SEO. I'm using a subcategory as local SEO. And then I'm using just two tags. It's Google My Business and it's UTM tagging as, as tags. So what happens when you use too many tags, as in this case seven, is that WordPress by default creates an individual page on your website for each tag that you use. So if you create seven tags, you've now created seven pages on your website. And Pam mentioned earlier that big sites are good, but not when you're creating kind of thin pages at scale, and we'll talk about some of the drawbacks. So again, the category and tags pages, this is what they normally look like. Uh, pages are created for all categories and tags. There is really no static content. It's all dynamic. So it's going to show the most recent posts that are in that category or tag. There's not going to be a lot of crawlable text or really much even describing what the page is about. Uh, and those pages are going to, um, well, let's skip ahead of slide. So page benefits, let's talk about that. There are pluses here, which is that the tag pages create internal links, and those internal links help search engines crawl your website and find all the pages, and crawling them and finding them is the step to getting ranked in search results. And it also prevents island pages. So an island page would be an example where um, there is a page on your website that is not accessible from your website itself. So if you planted someone on the home page, they would not be able to click through the site and find an island page, because there are no links to it from the, the site in a whole. So in this example, if you have six posts and you all tag them with the same tag, that tag page will have links to all six of those posts. And then if a search engine lands on the tag page, they can crawl those links and they'll find all those pages and know that they exist. Um, they can also find them from your main blog page. So you're kind of a little bit of redundancy. So you have two areas where if a search engine hit it, they can find the links and find the posts. Now up in this right corner is an example of an island page, and I labeled that as WordPress page because that's the difference between WordPress posts and WordPress pages. When you create a WordPress post, it is by default put into your, your main blog page at the top is the most recent one. And then if you tag it with a tag or a category, it'll appear on those pages as well. If you create a WordPress page, you have to do something to link that from the website. There are no links automatically created for new pages that you create. So if you're creating pages at will, you either have to add links to them from other pages on the site or within blog posts or add them to the navigation or do something so that when a search engine lands on your home page, it can spider its way through all the links and find all of your pages. Um, island pages have been shown to rank not as well as pages that are accessible through the site because the logic is, why is this here? Am I supposed to see it? Is it hidden? Um, an, an example of an island page you would want would be if you had like a thank you page after signing up for like a newsletter. So if you signed up for an email list and it sent you to another page, the thank you page, a lot of time your goal conversions are based on that. So you don't want people to get to that page unless they've submitted their email. So that's an island page that you shouldn't access from the site uh, any other way unless you sign up for like an email list. So, uh, all right, category and tag page drawbacks. Uh, like I mentioned, most of the content is dynamic. Um, on the right is kind of a diagram of what that page would look like, where you'll have the category up top, and then you'll have, I don't know how many posts, maybe four. 
and your post one, the oldest post on that page, would be at the bottom or on page two. And then your post four, in this case, the newest post, would be at the top. So um, there's very little unique content here because you're basically displaying excerpts from individual blog posts. So that's sort of duplicated, but it's not really a big problem for SEO because um, search engines see it and they're just like, well, this is a category page. They push it to the side. Um, and these pages won't get a lot of traffic because like I said, there's, there's very little crawlable text that's unique. The content is changing all the time. And when it's changing, if a search engine finds it, it might have drastically different text on Tuesday than it does on Friday if you've been actively publishing, if that makes sense. Um, so when it, the topic might be changing based on the text on the page, it's hard to rank those pages for any keywords because what are they about? Well, it could change week to week. So what do you do about it? Well, thin content isn't ideal. Uh, and this qu constitutes thin because most of it is duplicated from your actual blog post. They're just excerpts. So we want to no-index the category and tag pages uh, so that they won't appear in search results. And I'll explain why we're doing that. So no-indexing is uh, the process of adding an HTML tag that is just for search engines. And we want to add it to all of the category and tag pages. And that HTML tag tells search engines when they land on those pages, um, don't show this content in search results for whatever reason. Um, and we want to apply that to all of the category and tag pages, which sounds kind of daunting, but there's good news. So in terms of how we know index, uh, Yoast makes it super easy. And if you go into your dashboard and go down to the SEO menu and um, go to search appearance and click on the taxonomies tab on the top there, it'll give you the option for um, categories and tags show these in search results and like highlighted here you should just click that to know and that's a one one-stop shop for basically adding no index tags to all those pages so that they don't show up in search results um, and I know you guys are taking notes I see some people taking pictures I forgot to mention that link at the top um, chrisberkeley.com slash WCLVPA if you go there um, you can download my slides and, and have this later so um, this will all be available to you so why do we know index? Well, because basically when it comes to SEO and looking at your website, not all of your pages are valuable, to tell you the truth. Um, and we only want to really show the top pages to search engines because those are the ones that we want them to crawl and index and rank for the keywords that we're targeting. And we also want to avoid keyword cannibalization. Keyword cannibalization is the, pres uh, the premise that you might have two pages on your site that are competing to rank for the same keywords. And if that's the case, a search engine might find them and be a little bit unclear about which one to rank. So it could do a couple things. Either it'll randomly pick one and rank that one. Could be the wrong one. Um, or it'll kind of rank both of them, but not very well. Or it'll decide just to rank neither of them. So an example of that would be here. If I have on my website an SEO services page, which is really important to me because that's what I do and I want clients to see it, and I have an SEO category page from my blog, and they're both kind of optimized for SEO terms, well, I want people to come to the SEO services page. And I really don't care that much about the SEO category page because that's not, it doesn't really talk about what I do, it just has some blog posts on it. So in that case, we, we no-index those category pages and we make sure that it doesn't conflict with other pages on our site. And before you do that though, um, you should look in Google Analytics and just make sure that those pages aren't getting traffic. Um, from time to time, I have seen, especially with smaller sites or smaller clients, um, sometimes those pages are ranking for some stuff. So if that's the case, you'd want to look at that and say, all right, well, maybe we need to come up with a strategy to create a page to replace this if, for whatever reason, our category or tag pages are driving some kind of traffic. Um, to tell you the truth, it's probably not very good traffic because people that land on that you know, are maybe clicking on a blog post or maybe just bouncing. Um, but nevertheless, it, traffic is traffic. So the way you can do this is go into Google Analytics and, um, well, we'll skip to the next slide. It has a, a screenshot here. So go into Google Analytics and go into the left-hand sidebar over to Acquisition, and then go down to All Traffic and click on Channels. Uh, the third thing you're going to want to do is go to Primary Dimension and set that as the landing page if it's not set already. The fourth thing that you're going to want to do is put in a uh, slash category and then a vertical pipe and then slash tag. And then that's basically just a search box. So that's going to search your landing pages to find landing pages that have slash category in the URL or slash tag in there. And then from there, you can look and see if any of those pages are driving traffic. And for me, uh, in a one month period, that was three sessions. Um, none of them completed a contact form or did any goal conversions. And I'm willing to sacrifice my three visits for 
um, you know, cleaning up my site and, and eliminating some of those pages from search results. So there's one alternative to this, um, which is, you know, well, what if we optimize the category and tag pages? Can we make them better? And we can, but it's a lot of work. So what you'd want to do with these is we could add optimized text. Um, I didn't write it in this case. I just kind of threw in this visual mock-up to show you what it might look like. That would say a little bit about what types of posts are going to be on this page. Um, you know, saying, hey, these are SEO topics, and kind of talk about, you know, maybe my specialties and what I write about. Um, doesn't really fix the issue of it competing with my services page, but it would maybe help it rank. Um, it'll increase the content quality, and that'll make sure that it's really no longer thin content. So whereas before, we didn't have any unique text on that page, now we have a little bit of static content that's there um, for search engines to find. Um, but there are you know, drawbacks here as well, which is that there's no sorting or filtering functionality. So even if I wanted to optimize uh, my category page and say, here are topics about this, um, there's no way for me to order them or, or put them in any logical you know, order. Um, so you can't order group content. And really, chronological order is not a great user experience for people. Um, you know, if you're looking for SEO articles, you might be looking for 10 different things. And what you're going to be seeing is the one I wrote about most recently. Um, so in that regard, I, I don't normally advocate optimizing those pages because it's just it's too much development effort. It's, it's too technical. It still doesn't really give you a, a great page for search. Um, I would generally advocate creating like a WordPress page and then you know, building it out that way where you can kind of structure you know, content in the order that you want it. Um, you know, like if you were going to write about like Google Analytics, you could say how to set it up on WordPress, um, how to exclude your IP address, how to set up custom reports like Andy talked about earlier, um, you know, how to set up goal conversions. You could start to order it in a way for someone who is maybe new to it to understand better. Um, so like I said, don't normally advocate for optimizing these. So summary. Um, use your categories and tags methodically. Um, build a predetermined structure for maximum benefit. Uh, do not keyword stuff your categories or tags, because like we talked about, for every one that you use, it creates a page on your site. And then you could have hundreds or even thousands of these pages that have very little content on them. Um, and then search engines are going to spend time on those pages when you'd prefer to have them on your, your services pages or your money pages. Um, but they do help search engines crawl and index content. So even though these search engines will not put them in search results because we've no index to them, they will still crawl the links on that page, which is helpful. Um, like I said, they're not really benefit for driving traffic themselves. I've looked at a lot of clients with this. They rarely ever drive any kind of meaningful traffic, even if they do, do a few sessions. Um, no index them, the category and tag pages with Yoast. And uh, like I said, optimizing them is possible, but not ideal. It, it's just probably too much time and budget and effort for, for most people. Um, yeah, so we have time for questions now, and if you guys think of them later, of course, you can hit me up uh, at email, chris at chrisberkeley.com. I'm on Twitter as at berkeleybikes, and uh, like I said, you can get the slides at chrisberkeley.com slash WCLVPA. I have a question. Yes. This one is targeted to, to text and categories for posts. Mm -hmm. How would that affect a commercial site selling product that they use blog posts to talk about events like a show that they're doing or a new product coming out? Or That's a good question. So the question was, this is about tags and categories for posts, but what about an e-commerce site that was selling products and was using the blog to highlight new products, talk about them, or um, sure. potentially also like events or things that were coming up? So that's a great question. So with e-commerce, I very often advocate for creating supporting content for products. So you have a product page or a product category page that would be like you know women's boots, for example. Um, and you want to create surrounding content because that's a competitive keyword that would support that. So I actually have a shoe client right now, and we're doing some of that stuff where they just came out with boat shoes. So we're creating blog content for um, styles that you can wear with boat shoes, how to clean boat shoes. Um, 
what else? The difference in like laced versus laceless. We're creating that supporting content, and then within those blog posts, we're building links back to the product pages and the category pages, so that we're sort of creating a, uh, we're showing search engines that we know boat shoes outside of just products. Um, and then with events, you can do the same thing like we talked about kind of examples with the um, arts councils or theater companies where if you have events coming up, you know, you could tag them as, you know, summer events or things like that. And that would kind of help uh, build like a network of, of links between similar types of events. I have a question for you. Yes. I have a site um, I developed a year and a half ago. Um, and I thought I was being pretty good with categories and tags. And actually, you know, what I see here, I have been pretty good. Um, what I did about half a year ago was I went back to my old blog on Blogger, um, which had about three years worth of content. And I decided, you know, I got, I got a plug in, I imported it, um, figuring I'd round my site out with contents. Well, now the categories and tags are all across the map. There's duplications of things that are the same thing, but worded a tiny bit different. Um, I sort of had a slightly different thinking on it when I did it with Blogger, so they're not really meshing well. Um, what would be my best way to handle that? Yeah, I don't, there may be a plugin out there or something that would kind of help you clean that up in bulk. Um, I don't have any great recommendations right now for, for doing that. Um, a lot of times if I see that in the past, I kind of, unless it's really egregious, kind of choose to ignore it or um, you know, just kind of work to build a structure going forward. Because the cleanup is, I mean, especially working with clients, nobody wants to pay for cleanup. You know? And um, it, it's just so much time and effort to do it yeah. that I'm usually like, well, let's just kind of clean it up going forward. And unless it's in the hundreds or thousands, then you know, we'll, we'll look at it. It's a low traffic site, so yeah. it's maybe not the most critical thing. But every time I do a new post and I see all those kind of extraneous tags, it drives me a little nutty. Yeah, I should come up with. Uh, I'll have to. I'll, I'll, that could be a separate talk about how to do the cleanup. It's, it's a good idea. yeah. It's a, but no matter how you do it, it's basically a pretty significant amount of time and effort. So um, I usually try to tell people, well, all right, unless it's like I said, really bad, let's focus on building a structure going forward that's more optimized and streamlined. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, I've only begun adding um, tags to my blog. Uh, I have a widget for categories. Now the tag pages are there. How, how do you get to that as, as a user when you're on the blog section? Uh, how do you get to a tag page? Yeah, a tag page is not going to see a thing. So it's, it's really kind of theme-based, but most of your themes will somewhere on your uh, blog page or your blog post include a link over to the tag page. Um, a lot of the times you can do widgets on the side um, for you know uh, tags and categories. Um, the other thing I did not mention is looking at analytics data. Humans don't very often click on those. Um, especially if you put them in the sidebar. I, I think those, in general, just aren't a great user experience. Um, I'm going to tag um, directly under the snippet. Uh, if you click on that, it'll take you to that tag page. Yeah. If you have an article with a category and it'll say tags down here, and you click on that tag, it'll take you to that tag page. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, I mean, in terms of where you kind of put them, it's kind of up to you. Like, I wouldn't advocate getting rid of them entirely because then you're kind of eliminating that inherent link structure. Like, that's a really nice WordPress-specific fail-proof plan to make sure that all your content's linked to each other. Um, like, I've run into issues before with clients and other content management platforms that didn't have that. Um, in terms of where you put it, you know, a lot of themes will put it in the post kind of right under the heading. Um, you could put it at the bottom. I don't know how much of a functional difference it makes to, to site visitors. Do you actually need that, or am I just creating tags for search engines? I mean, so the other thing you could do is you could look at your page views report and see how often people click on them. Because even if they're not driving traffic from search, um, I mean, you really wouldn't be getting traffic to them most other ways, because you're probably not posting your category and tag pages to social or anything like that. Um, you could look at the page views report and see how much traffic they get from people clicking through them on the site. And that may vary a little bit site to site. Um, but if you're not getting a lot of traffic that way, then. But for SEO, you should have that tag page there. You should have tags on all your blogs. All your yeah. posts should have tags. 
Yeah. So, and, and the other thing, ideally, with internal linking, right, is that it's good to have all of your pages linked to your other pages for, for visitors and for search engines. Um, this is an automated way to do it, kind of at scale, and building sort of like a safety net. So you're building a web of links that search engines can follow on your site to make sure that everything gets found and crawled. But you should also you know, be including internal links in the body copy to, you know, from like one relevant post to another one that was similar, and doing that as well. Because those will be more valuable links. Um, those would be the ones that will probably pass more internal link equity than these which like I said are really for more of the technical side of SEO which is helping pages get found. So I just felt that when it, uh, a lot of people don't know about web developing and when they come onto the website and read a blog article they don't know what the word tags means. They just see the word tags and then it has a couple of uh, categories in there. Yeah, well, and the other, the other way that you could, I mean, you could sort of rebrand that and, and change the, you know, edit the theme to say, like, you know, um, so posts about, you know, whatever the topics are. Um, I think by default, you know, there's a lot of room to optimize those, and if you're a developer or you have a developer that can work with you, you can do some things with it. Um, I think if you're kind of a, a someone who is a blogger or edits the site yourself, I think it's probably too much effort. So that might be a little bit of the difference in, in how much work you want to do on those. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the impact of uncategorized. Uncategorized. Um, or if you could just share your thoughts on it. Yeah, sure. So again, if we if we look at your website as a tree, right, and we go from your home page and we go through your navigation to your other pages and, and trickle on down. Um, you know, hopefully each of the pages has multiple links on the site to, to get to it. Again, both for visitors and, and for search engines. If you don't tag any of your blog posts um, with any tags or categories, then by default, the only link you'll have on the site is gonna be on that main blog page. Okay? And over time, as you start building out more and more blogs, you're going to see at the bottom, you know, page one, page two, page three, page four. So if you're 10 or 20 pages back, that could be the only link to actually get to that page, if that makes sense. So you're relying on a search engine, get to your website, get to the blog page, go down to the bottom, crawl all 20 pages to get back to that blog you wrote two years ago without any other links. Whereas if you use multiple tags and categories, now maybe it only has to go a couple posts down or one or two pages in. So that's kind of the difference, and search engines will crawl 20 pages deep, but how long it takes them to do that you know, might, might vary. Um, and then on top of that, I just don't like ever seeing uncategorized because it seems like it's just bad, it's bad user experience. Like this has got to be under some category. But Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Others, questions? First, you said we should index Yeah. also said that search engines use those Yep. Yes. So there, there's two things. I'm, I'm going to get more technical on you guys. Oh, God, I know it's 4 o'clock on a Friday. What am I doing? All right. So the more technical side of it is there's, there's something called new, no indexing, and there's something called no following. And no indexing tells a search engine, hey, you can crawl the links on this page, but don't, don't put this page in search results. Like, you can crawl all the content and follow those links to find other pages, but don't show this page in search. And then no following is something where you can select links and say, you can index this page, but don't, don't follow that link. So you're supposed to do that with like affiliate marketing because you're not supposed to be buying and selling links. Like if you have a link to Amazon, you're an affiliate and you get money for promoting a product and driving traffic there, you're not supposed to be giving that link to Amazon because it's sort of an exchange for money. So you would no follow a link like that to say, you can, you can index this page, but we don't want to count that link because it's affiliate and we don't want to get in trouble with the FCC or, or what have you. So to back up a little bit, we're no indexing, but we're following. So the, the category and tag pages won't appear in search results, but when a search engine does get to them through the site, they can crawl all the other links to your blog posts, which we do want indexed, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. I did all right on that one. <laughs> yes? It's like a really good example I have for the theater website that we have is we're like happy for them to crawl the pages that we talk about the shows. Yeah. We have a whole series of back links on there that inventory our catalog of props and furniture that frankly Showing up right. Yeah, and, and that's an important thing too. We're already down the technical rabbit hole. Why not? 
let's go deeper. So when search engines crawl the site, you know, they have a crawl budget. And based on how big of a site you are and how authoritative determines how often and how much they will come back to crawl the site. So uh, with a site like BuzzFeed or CNN or the New York Times, they're pinging that site daily and they're crawling it for hours at a time to find the new articles that they're writing and stuff like that because they're very authoritative. With smaller sites, they're not spending as much time crawling your site as they are the big ones. So we need to make sure that when they are crawling it, they're crawling the pages that we find valuable that we want to be in search results. So if they get there and they start crawling and they find a hundred tag pages and crawl all those and then leave without hitting the services page, that would be bad. So what we're doing is we're basically saying when they, when they find them, ah, all right, well, you can crawl this, but you know, like, don't index this one. And then that kind of tells them, all right, well, I can move on and index the, the more efficient ones. And then when they come back later, they will probably be crawling the pages that we've said, yes, please index these because why would you keep crawling a page that you don't want in search? So that's a little bit of the difference too. Anything else? It's done. Everybody's done. It's all right. One more. One more. Go for it. Um, I have a clothing store website. Yep. And I sell takes and cheese that I make that have tummy cheeks and meat and milk and So my question is, how do I tag? How many tags do you suggest that the woman take? It has a specific saying on it. How many tags do you suggest for that to describe that one take? Because I have hundreds. Like uh, the, I mean, I imagine the sayings are probably kind of themed. Like they sometimes they're topical or. Like bombshell. Like there's an example of bombshell or something that just says that. So yeah, like I mean. That's a good, that's if you search and you, you know, other people may make the same tank. Right. Right. So like, how do I tag them so they're coming to my site? Yeah, so you might, you might build out a category. You know, your categories could maybe start to be um, styles and um, men's versus women's, kids, et cetera. So maybe that's a way to kind of at that high level start to segment them that way where it's pretty clear cut. And then adding tags underneath, um, yeah, might, might be topical. Um, that's kind of a hard one, to be honest. Yeah, what would you say? Yeah, like, 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 so you might, you might do it based on like sarcastic, funny, things like that. And those would honestly like transcend your category. So like men's and women's could both be sarcastic. So in that case, you have a tag that kind of goes in both categories, which is fine. Um, all the models that I have that, where all the stuff that I make, I actually have a blog post that's attached to my website. And I do features of these women. They could be, you know, helping build houses. And yeah. So we have that. So how do you tag, how do you go about tagging the blog? That's a good one too. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, maybe there are kind of common themes. Like maybe some of them are inspirational, or maybe some of them are like overcoming adversity. Um, you know, maybe kind of based on recurring themes that you see would be a good way to do it. Because um, I don't usually, I wouldn't recommend using a tag if you're only going to use it on one post ever. Um, you'd ideally want to have multiple posts with that tag. So maybe that's the angle you could, you could start to do it and, and tag it that way. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Anybody else? Cool. All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it.